Good morning, saints of the house churches of the Alliance Church. If you don't have one on hand, please get a Bible, a pen, and a piece of paper ready. I'll be giving you 10 seconds to do that. What I'll ask you to do is to write down as many of these TV and movie titles as you can. There'll be 20 in total. Now you can do this collaboratively as a household, and I'll leave the answers in the description below. Now I remember back in the day, these were the shows and movies that I grew up with. Then in the last 20 years, there's been a shift in the zeitgeist that's reflected by how popular these shows and movies are. We can't live together. We're gonna die alone. You've probably noticed how the first montage showed mostly shows and movies that focused on a single protagonist. And yes, you may have also noticed that they were all Caucasian males. That was to show that that was the avatar of the baby boomer and Gen X generations in the Western world, or more particularly, the American culture. These avatars were individuals having to pull up their bootstraps to man up and get her done. The second showed the generational and cultural shift. What became popular was the ensemble cast that became more and more diverse and reflected the diversity of the Western culture. And this is even more represented in James Gunn's Guardians of the Galaxy, a motley menagerie of misfits, each with their own tragic backstory. Peter Quill, who lost his mother at a young age. Drax, whose family was murdered and seeks revenge for their deaths. Gamora, whose family and half of her home world was wiped out by a genocidal maniac who ended up raising her as his own. How messed up is that? Rocket, the raccoon-like being that endured brutal and painful experimentation early in his life. Each had their flaws and quirks. They don't always agree and they bickered constantly. But when the fate of the planet was on the line, and when billions of lives were at stake, they pulled together to defeat a powerful being whose nickname was of all things, the Accuser. This shift in pop culture not only reflected the diversity of the culture, but with this shift came the important message that coincides with Paul's message to the house churches in Philippi. And the message is this, we're stronger when we work together. In today's passage, we finally get an insight into the circumstance of why Paul wrote this letter, as well as the nature of Paul's relationship with the house churches in Philippi. We find that this portion of the letter contributes to a deeper understanding of the whole letter, as well as being a microcosm of the other parts of the letter, as I hope we'll see. So the message for today is, we're stronger when we work together. We are stronger when we work together. We don't normally get to do this, but in Paul's and Timothy's letter to the house churches in Philippi, we can reconstruct a timeline. The Philippians heard about Paul's imprisonment, most likely in Rome. Now the Philippians are used to Paul being in prison since he and Silas were jailed on their first visit to Philippi a decade or so earlier as recorded in Acts 16. 
The house churches collected money and supplies to send with Epaphroditus, who got so sick he almost died. Thankfully, he did not, and he spent time with Paul and worked alongside him while he recovered. During this time, Epaphroditus would have told Paul stories about their peeps in Philippi, both good and bad. It's often the case that bad stories lead Paul to address them in his letters, like the ones to the Galatians, the Thessalonians, and the Corinthians. The two main issues that Paul wanted to address among the Philippian house churches were the feud between Euodia and Syntyche, as well as the growing influence of some people who would steer them away from the example of King Jesus. Now, in order for us to understand what Paul is doing in the whole letter, I need to introduce a couple of interpretive grids so that we can zero in on what Paul is doing. The first interpretive grid is seeing things through the lens of an honor-shame worldview, which will likely be intuitive for many but not for some. To introduce some key features, I'll bring in this guy from YouTube. I'll call him Thugs, talking head of Global Semester. Now in the second worldview paradigm, honor and shame. Number one, this worldview is mostly dominant in Asia and the Middle East. Number two, the point of reference is the community. The community and the traditions of the community define what is acceptable and unacceptable behavior, what brings honor and shame in the public eye. Number three, the needs and concerns of the group are publicly more important than those of the individual members of the group. Number four, as a result, there is a strong collectivistic thinking and decision-making. Each member is expected to fulfill their role in the family or community based on their age, gender, and position. Number five, tradition and traditional ways of doing things are highly valued. In some cases, the teachings of wise and honorable ancestors are respected and kept. Six, most importantly, actions are done to maximize honor and to minimize shame. Number seven, honor is high social worth in the eyes of the community. Bringing honor to the family name in the eyes of the larger community is the name of the game. Having honor brings harmony, connection, unity, and influence with the community. Number eight, Shame is low social worth in the eyes of the community. It's not the same thing as personal feeling of guilt. It's losing face and bringing down the reputation of the family name. Number nine, the group might cover this shame by casting out this member or considering this person as dead or even killing this person. Or the person might do these things themselves. Number 10, the way back from shame to honor is to do something grand and good that would restore the honor, or for someone who has high status among the group to restore the honor of the person with low status in the community. Handsome fella. Looks awfully familiar. From an honor-shame point of view, these influencers could have been discrediting Paul and shaming him for being in prison so much. They could have been teaching the Philippians that they need to restore their honor in the eyes of the larger Jewish Jesus communities by going back to tradition that was passed on from Moses to the covenant people of Yahweh. Here's what Paul does in this letter. He redefines and recalibrates what honor means as a follower of King Jesus. And he bases this on the example of Jesus himself. The first hint that we get that Paul is redefining the concept of honor is in his greeting in chapter 1. Paul and Timothy, servants or slaves in some translations, of King Jesus. Among all his letters in the Bible, he uses this greeting title only one other time. Then in chapter 1, he talks about how some people proclaim Jesus out of rivalry, to gain honor or to shame Paul. But Paul is confident that he will not be ashamed because he will be vindicated and King Jesus will be honored whether Paul is dead or alive. Then in chapter 2, Paul uses the commonly known worship song during that time that gives the example of Jesus redefining what it meant to have honor. It's not through selfish ambition or gaining status over others, as Jesus could have done this since he already had the highest honor status. Instead, Jesus came in humility. Now being a slave and a servant is normally considered shameful 
and meant that you had low status in the eyes of the larger community, but Jesus was an example of someone who was a humble servant of God. And dying on the cross was a humiliating and shameful way to die, but Jesus died to cover humanity's shame and restore our honor in the eyes of God. Humble service and sacrificial love. For Paul, this is what honor is. This is the way. This is the way. This is what God is like, and this is what true humanity is to be like as well. And this is what will be vindicated and rewarded in the end. Just as Jesus was exalted to the highest place as King and Lord by God the Father. Then Paul, still in chapter 2, gives two exemplars of humility, self-giving, and self-sacrifice. Timothy, who is genuinely concerned for people's welfare. Epaphroditus, who nearly died and Paul says to honor such people. Then in chapter 3, he gives the anti-example. What others might consider honorable in Roman and Jewish communities, things like cultural identity markers, tribe names, status, accomplishments, where you studied, what you learned. Paul says that's not true honor. They're just pieces of scubala. Yes, he does use a vulgar term. Instead, the end game is to be exalted and raised just as Jesus was raised, from humility to honor, from this old creation body to the new creation body. That's when you'll really know that what you've done has been worth it. And that's the prize that Paul has been pressing on for. Then Paul invites the Philippians to pursue this redefinition of honor and shame with the example of Jesus, with the examples of Timothy and Epaphroditus, and with the example of Paul himself. Then more specifically, he implores Euodia and Syntyche, almost shaming them, to reconcile, to humble themselves, to think of the other more highly, and to be of like mind. Then he commends them all to continue to reflect more on this by recalibrating their thinking of what is honorable, what is commendable, and what is worthy of praise. Then we come to today's passage where Paul honors their example. He commends them for their generosity, partnership, and sharing in his sufferings. He honors them for understanding what church is from the very beginning. From their humble beginnings in Acts 16, where there were probably only three house churches, they partnered with Paul in giving and receiving. Maybe Lydia, the purple cloth merchant in Acts 16, 14 was rich, sure, but not the family of the slave girl healed from her powers of divination and lost her source of income, or the Philippian jailer who was probably just getting minimum wage. But they were the ones who partnered with Paul. They immediately recognized what the capital C church was meant to be, what this body of King Jesus is meant to be. We are meant to work together and we are meant to be sharers with one another because we are stronger when we work together. And finally, from the very beginning in his greetings and to his closing remarks, Paul calls each member of the house churches in Philippi who will have heard this letter read as saints. Paul calls them saints because they've already been separated and made holy for a purpose. They have transferred their allegiance from Caesar to King Jesus. They didn't have to do anything to become saints, but when they believed, obeyed, trusted, and followed the example of King Jesus, their honor in the eyes of God had been restored. Not that they're perfect, but cleansed, so that they don't have to be anxious about this thing called the assurance of salvation and they don't have to live in shame and to wonder what other people are thinking about them. We are stronger when we work together. Now remember Paul's concerns were the feud between Euodia and Syntyche? 
and the growing influence of some people who would steer them away from the example of King Jesus. These are serious concerns for Paul because they caused the church to divide instead of continuing to be unified. Division is not cool in the kingdom of God. Division causes chaos, conflict, and calamity. But unity, now there's something to talk about here. There's something miraculous that happens here, what I'd like to call Messiah math. What I'm talking about here is peppered throughout the letter, but I wanted to focus on chapter 4, verses 14 to 20. There seems to be the language of finance and economics in these verses. However, I don't think Paul is primarily concerned about material wealth here, earthly or heavenly. I suggest that Paul's point is social wealth, honor in the eyes of the community, influence among the community. And this community is the larger world that is looking at the church to see if it will bring honor or shame to the name of Jesus Christ. In chapter 417, there are two Greek words that have caused translation headaches. Karpon, which in almost all of the uses of this word in the New Testament, means fruit. Like, a good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. Or the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. This is why the ESV is correct here, but in other translations you might read profit, which totally turns it into a financial term. But fruit is something that grows. It's the character traits that are the fruit that grows from us, from people, from the whole body of Christ. It's not material wealth to be amassed or hoarded, nor is it only to be used for our own purposes. If we go intertextual to the book of Revelation, we can see the end game purpose of fruit. In Revelation 22 verse 2, we read about the tree of life, symbolizing Jesus, that's yielding fruit, symbolizing the church, and its leaves are for the healing of the nations. God's purpose in Jesus, through his church, is to give life, to bring restoration and reconciliation for the nations. The fruit is to be used for the purpose of restoring the worth of nations. It's to seek out and to transform the nations for the kingdom of God. The other problematic translation is for the Greek word logos, or logon as it's conjugated here. In almost all the translations of this word in the New Testament, it's translated as word. It's also translated as account, but not like a bank account, but in the sense of a story. More like tell a story or to give an account. The ESV is a bit more accurate here when it uses credit. Not in the credit and debit sense of a bank account though. More like, I'll give him credit for that, meaning to give praise or recognition for what has been done. So when Paul talks about fruit that increases to your credit, this is the idea of other people telling more stories about these house churches and of their generosity, self-sacrifice, and unity. Remember, this is what we've been talking about in this whole letter to the Philippians. The idea of Paul redefining honor and shame. In this case, he's emphasizing that when you are humble, when you are self-giving, when you are sacrificing your time, your gifts, and your resources to serve others so that it's fruitful for others, that is what brings you true honor. That is what honor is. That's what's going to be exalted and reach up as a fragrant offering to God. That's why God will lift up those who do this. They will be vindicated and raised up to places of honor so that the nations will see and know that this is what God's people are to be like. So this passage is not like this. but more like this.
When we are like this as a unified community, humble, self-giving, sacrificial, generous, serving others, we receive honor from King Jesus that translates to social influence. We become influencers to our next generation, and we become influencers to those who are just starting to get to know who King Jesus is. And we become examples of God's goodness and generosity in our communities and around the world. This is what true honor is. This is the way. For those of us who like to take notes, here are the three marks of what it means to be the church. Spoiler alert, it's not the building, it's the people. The first mark of a Jesus community is humility. Being the church means having the posture of humility towards one another and towards other people. Jeff Greenman, the current president of Regent College, puts it this way, what makes for Christian community is humility. What stands in its way is arrogance. The second mark of a Jesus community is interdependence. Being the church means sharing and partnering. Sharing in each other's lives, sharing our joys and our sadness, our triumphs and our tribulations, but also sharing when others are in need and asking for help when we need it. It's no longer man up and get her done, but let's see what we can do together. It's interdependence, not independence. It's more than just me and mine, but instead more about us and ours. We are to be more than just people who go to church, but people who will be the church for the healing of nations. The third mark of a Jesus community is participation. I had a high school biology teacher who told the class, don't just be bumps on logs. We're meant to be not just passive consumers of content, but pumped up participants of what it means to be in Jesus. We're meant to be a community that cares for each other. A community that cares for those outside of the community. And a community that cares to bring honor to the King whom we serve and whom we have pledged our allegiance to. Now to make it more practical, I'll read one of the best children's books I've ever come across. We're gonna read a book called One to Me by Linda Grace Smith. No one is free if even one is oppressed <laughs> and has basic rights that are left unaddressed. As long as there's one who hasn't a floor, a roof and four walls with a window and a door, there's one too many. As long as there's one with no jammies to wear, <laughs> no soap for her bath, and no brush for her hair, there's one too many. As long as there's one who is sick and in pain, and hasn't the treatment to get well again, there's one too many. As long as there's one without any food, no veggies or bread, no meat to be stewed. But there is stuff to eat. Yeah, but it's just imaginary, it's not really there. There's... One too many. As long as there's one with no water nearby, and his land and his garden and well are all dry. There's one too many. As long as there's one who's forbidden from school, but instead has to work in a hard, with a hard heavy tool. There's one too many. As long as there's one who often gets hurt, mistreated and teased and pushed down in the dirt. There's one too many. But someone is with her. Yeah, but not really there. It's just imagination. Yeah, but we'll see. As long as there's one who is only alone, no friends and no family, he's never been known. There's one too many. But when one turns toward instead of away, the math turns round in a powerful way. As long as there's one who welcomes a guest with a warm place to sit and a safe place to rest, one turns to two. As long as there's one with a nice second pair who sees that they're needed and chooses to share, two turns to three. As long as there's one who hears a friend's cough and waits for the nurse till the fever cools off, 
three turns to four. As long as there's one who offers a dish and not only gives, but then teaches to fish, four turns to five. As long as there's one who finds water to drink and then pipes a path from the source to the sink, five turns to As long as there's one who opens the way to read and to write and to learn and to play, six turns to seven. As long as there's one who steps in and defends and bravely ensures that the cruelty ends, seven turns to eight. As long as there's one with a heart that is able to welcome the lonely with a place at the table, eight turns to nine. When one turns to two and three turns to four, the load is not held by just one anymore. It only takes one who addresses a need until one by one, everyone has been freed. The sermon is meant to be more than just communicating knowledge of highbrow theology or just giving us all the spiritual feels. It's meant to remind us who God is and who we are and how we are meant to be in this world that would bring honor to King Jesus. This is the way. This is the way. In this season, let us remember the spirit-filled servant of God, the long-awaited faithful King, Jesus the God-man who came in humble human form. And let us remember that just over a hundred years ago, humanity survived a worse pandemic. We too will survive. Humanity survived an economic collapse, a Great Depression, and two world wars we too will survive. The question now is, will there be fruit that will increase to our credit? Will the stories about the house churches of the Alliance bring honor or shame to King Jesus and the Kingdom of God? Perhaps, as a church, we're more like the Motley Crew and James Gunn's Guardians of the Galaxy. We all have our backstories. We all have our quirks and flaws. We all have our different roles and talents. But when there are things like arguments or disagreements, will we humble ourselves and see each other as better than us? When there are things and fads that are steering us away from the example of Jesus, will we commit to follow the examples of those who continue to display the fruit of humble service and sacrificial love? And when the chips are down and the real accuser tries to destroy our worlds one by one, will we band together because we're stronger together and say, Set it yourself. We're the guardians of the galaxy. Humble service and sacrificial love. This is real honor. This is the way. This is the way.